Cornette has plans for you, Dusty. Uh, Cornette has plans for everybody. Mama talks to Cornette. Cornette talks to Bubba. Bubba talks to Bobby Eaton. Don't talk a lot because Bobby Eaton can't talk. Stan Lee talks to Bobby Eaton. Bobby Eaton can't talk. Now you're talking to the superpowers. Dusty Rose, the Kina Cola. 1988, I committed to the United States of America. The U.S. title all over this country. The Kina Cola committed to the world. World television title all over this country. And now come in. You come in here, bring your boys in here, and jump on Dusty Rose, the American Dream. You made it personal. You've been talking about my mama, my family. That's personal. My sister alone could whip you on any street in this country. Any street in this country. So now they're Dick Murdoch. All of them will start Dusty Rose, the American Dream, and the Kena Cut Off. 1988 is the big year, baby. This year we're going to bust the bubble. We're the biggest, the baddest, and the best. And we're going to take care of you, Mr. Cornette, in five fashion, Jeff. And tell your mama at home that I got something far. You know what I'm talking about? Welcome, Life Gang. This is your host, Lamont Tyson. And this is a very rare occasion. I got my man, Britt Whitmire, out here. So you know it's going to be something special. Co-host James Booker, lifelong wrestling fan. And because of these two is how I know everything about wrestling, <laughs> other than when I watched it on TV. And we're here to talk about the passing of a wrestling legend. Yep. Last week we lost Dusty Rhodes, one of the greatest that has ever done it. And now the question I would like to ask as we do this tribute is, what was your fondest memory of Dusty Rhodes? I got a, I got a million of them. Um, we were talking about this on the Katie Vickers Alive Alive podcast, which you can get on iTunes or Stitcher or TuneIn or SoundCloud. It's a show I do with my friend Brian Williams. Uh, we do it once a week, two times a week if there's a pay-per-view. So I, I went back and I looked through all the Dusty Rhodes stuff, particularly on YouTube. And I don't know how you quantify what kind of performer he was. Mm -hmm. But maybe you start with this. I don't know if there's another guy in wrestling history that cut more money promos than that guy. Go oh, oh, yeah. God. I mean, there's a lot of guys who talk up a storm, and they Jeez. did very, very well. And, you know, Roddy Piper's a great talker. Of course, Ric Flair was a fantastic talker. There's been some great talkers throughout who've been very good at talking you into a building. But when it comes to the category of money promos... I don't know if anybody touches that guy. And so, guys, as you saw when we came into this video, right in the beginning, there was a couple of clips of him doing a promo. Go back and just listen to how in front of time he right. was. He was well established and giving great promos. And, and James, what was hey, your I, fondest I, memory? Well, I was going to say, you know, that was the amazing thing apart about him was, let's say he had never wrestled a match. Yeah. Everything else he did would have still made him a legend of equal level, you know? I mean, the promos he cut, the matches he invented, sure. the guy didn't even have to wrestle. The fact that he also wrestled made him, uh, I mean, he's probably the most complete package of a wrestler that we have seen at any point in history. You, you guys are going to laugh, but you know what I liked about him? What was that? I started watching him hard during the WWE days when he was had that manager with the polka dot. Yep. And so what Sweet I... Sweet Sapphire, by the way. Sweet, Sweet Sapphire. Sapphire. And what I enjoyed about him was... He wasn't in shape like Hulk Hogan. Um, he was a common man. Yes. And he was in front of his time on diversity at the time as well. What? Which Sapphire got my grandma into the wrestling. And she said, honey, looking at me as about an eight-year-old that was about 210 pounds, you can be him. <laughs> and, I mean, that was just a, anybody could look at him and say, if he can do it, why the hell not me? Well, I, I think that's where a lot of the UFC fans kind of lose it. They go, oh, that guy? You guys paid tickets to see that guy? A lot of times when the UFC guys will go at the end of their matches and they'll go, well, who do you want to fight next? And the guy will go, ah, whoever they put up there, I'll be just fine. And the point is, you should be doing a promo on some guy. Pick some guy out and act like he's Satan and go after him. That's what draws money. But when you talk about one memory, I mean, the Hard Times promo is kind of like the Stairway to Heaven of wrestling. One of, I mean, if, if mm. not the greatest promo of all time, one of the, I think it's right up there with Austin 316 since yep. I just kicked yep. your ass. Yep. It's, it's yep. iconic. I mean, it, it's one of those things that you can recite and you can add stuff to it. I love the Hard Times promo. It, it, that sold people tickets for years and years. And you can just, you can hear the theme song in your head, can't you? Right. At any moment. I mean, there, there wasn't much to it, but man, that got you excited every time. When you, when you talk about seeing Dusty, though, in the WWE, yeah. when we saw him when he came in, I'm, I've, got a, I've got a few years on you boys. Mm -hmm. uh, when he came in the NWA, when he came in to the Mid-Atlantic, it was around 83, 84. Right. That was when he, and they, 
they touted him as the working man, the blue class, the, mm -hmm. the blue collar hero, and all that stuff. And uh, basically, to me, and what it meant was, we didn't get it at the time, was it means he would hang around black folks. And yeah. they would show vignettes of him hanging around yeah. black folks mm -hmm. at a time when it was not something that you usually did, you know, that part of town or whatever. And he did, and, he, and, and it really kept promote. He had a lot of black fans. He was diverse. He had a lot of black fans because a lot of that stuff that he used, it was like black preacher stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I, I, I loved the way that he talked. I loved the way that, like you said, when he, when he was booking, it's a little behind the scenes kind of thing. He invented... A lot of the matches, the war games, war That's games a favorite was of mine still. a huge one. He was one of the guys who was very involved with the beginning of Starcade, some of the larger packages. Oh yeah. God, yeah. Uh, but the whole thing with him going and wearing the polka dots was that was a rib against that was Vince kind of making fun of him because he had competed against Vince and Vince said, "Well, I got a chance to get my hands on him now. I'm going to make him look dumb." Well, jokes on you. He got over. <laughs> the fans loved him. I think I saw him out here at the Coliseum when he did the polka dot gimmick. Yeah. Uh, that guy, it never occurred to me either when I was a kid going, eh, that guy's just fat. He's just tubby. I never thought that. I always thought, well, you know, there, I knew a lot of big, bulky dudes who could hurt you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's, I just always <laughs> assumed that's what it was. As a performer in the ring, he was good. He was not a great performer. He was not to the level of Ric Flair or, or Ricky Steamboat. Mm -hmm. But my gosh, he could talk. Oh, Lord. No, the way he made up for it. Uh, that's what made the matches. That, you know? If you can sell the event. <laughs> well, and that's what makes Ric Flair such a special entertainer is because he can both wrestle and he can talk. He can do both mm -hmm. of those things. Uh, and the, the two of them, them working together was just peanut butter and jelly because you had the blue collar guy from the streets and you had the blue blood guy who yeah, was the, to the manor born and he liked all the high lifestyle and all that stuff man it's, it, it's just amazing I really miss him it was quite a shock when I you know I found out I guess it was on Thursday when everybody found out that he had passed away. And there was very little warning to that. No. I mean, when yeah. you weren't hearing for days and days, oh, he's sick, the family went to be by his side, it was just boom. Very much passed. so. And he, he was always talking about John Wayne. He actually died on the same day that John Wayne died. Did he really? Yeah, John Wayne died June the 11th, or 1979. Oh, wow. And, of course, Virgil died in 2015. So um, they did some amazing tributes to him before the Money in the Bank pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. they They're going to do a lot of stuff uh, after Raw on the WWE Network. But it, you know, just an amazing perform for a lot of smiles on people's faces for a long time. He did, and you kind of hit on a point I was going to go to next for both of you guys. Who do you think was his, was the most iconic adversary to Dusty Rhodes? What was what was the matches or the opponents you felt brought out the best in Dusty Rhodes as an entertainer? There was something about him and Flair. Yeah, I mean, and they go to they've got some of those uh, promos leading up to the Starcade '85. Uh, those, those two could work off each other all day long, could draw money, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning in the middle of an alley. Those guys could draw money, and they were always tremendous together. I'd have to say those two. You go back to some of the stuff back in Florida when he was drawing money down there. He and Dick Murdoch together as a tag team were magnificent before that. Uh, you know, but something about Dusty and Flair was yeah. always amazing. I think all time that was, that was it. I went back and saw an amazing match between him and Harley Race, believe it or not. Right. I started getting into my history. Mm -hmm. And I f started going back seeing some of the things you just mentioned that he was doing yeah. back when I was two and three years old right. and didn't know what was going on. Right. This guy was a trailblazer. He was. And he was one of the very few guys I'm hearing from a lot of wrestlers. And I don't have a lot of wrestling friends. I got like two, but they know a whole <laughs> lot of stuff. He actually was one guy that was willing to help rear the next generation. Yeah, he, they, they talk about this a lot, and there's been a lot of talk. I, I think I'll eventually do this. The uh, Performance Training Center down in Orlando that the WWE mm -hmm. runs, mm -hmm. there, there, a lot of people on social media have been saying they should just rename that the, the Dusty Rhodes Performance Entertainment Center or whatever for Training Center. And I think that'll probably happen. But he was, you know, he was always trying to help those guys and they would have promo class. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't imagine being a 25-year-old guy walking in there and being taught. By, it, it's kind of like walking in and have Jimmy Page teach you guitar licks or something. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, at the age of 25, you would be so ignorant that you would not be overwhelmed by, oh, my God, I have to cut a promo in front of this guy and he's going to judge it because I would, I would lose my stuff. I would just go crazy. You're talking one of the probably the greatest mm -hmm. of all time to cut promos, and you've got to stand in front of him and yeah. look him straight in the eye that's right. and come up with something that's going to work. That's right. In today's generation, where certain things you can't tweak anymore the way you used to back in the day. Well, it's all uh, it's all supposed to be scripted now, which is really unfortunate. A lot of the guys are not allowed to be themselves, 
And that was one of the great things about him is he was totally allowed to be himself, and he drew money doing it, a lot of money doing it for a long time. Yeah, he did. So, and, and and getting you guys out of here, and thank you for coming to just share your memories of Dusty Rhodes and the impact he created. What would you say is his lasting legacy for both of you guys? Well, I, I think the a lot of the, the guys that he helped train right now are guys that are doing very well drawing money for the WWE, including like Bray Wyatt is one of those guys, and some of the guys who were FCW before that. Mm-hmm. So he's got that legacy. Obviously, his sons, his sons have had great careers, and, and Cody will certainly continue to have a great career for many, many years. Um, and that blue collar thing. No, oh, he captured that in a way that nobody else. Thinks. I think that's definitely his legacy. I mean, yeah, it was like he was a living textbook. That if you want to learn to be a great wrestler, watch his matches, yeah. watch his promos. That alone, I mean, it's like having your own textbook of how to do it right. Right. And, and guys, for me, the entertainment value that he brought, mm-hmm. the fact that he was someone in the media that didn't look the part. Right. His, yeah. I, I will continue to go back to that and the diversity that he brought and the certain sense of back in the day they didn't use the term but the swagger he brought yeah. to wrestling and entertainment yeah. back in those days it just made him an iconic love for me and God rest his soul thank you guys WWE and everyone that has done these wonderful tributes this man is very deserving yeah. and we will continue to look to see who can come and, and kind of follow in his footsteps but on this day we pay tribute to Dusty Rose, the American Dream. Guys, don't forget to like that video, comment, subscribe, go out there and get yourself a life game, and go do your history on Dusty Rose. You might learn that this guy was one of the greatest entertainers to ever do.